I'm Wesley. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm going to talk today about control theory, um, what it is, why I think it's fascinating. We're going to design a simple controller for an elevator system. And then I'm going to talk about the mathematical underpinnings behind control theory. So first off, what is control theory? Um, Wikipedia has this definition that it's a subfield of mathematics that deals with the control of continuously operating dynamical systems, where the objective is to develop a model to control such systems. So basically, we're dealing with continuously operating systems, and we want to figure out a way to control them. Um, and so I got interested in this because in high school, I was on a robotics team. And so we made robots that did things like this. right? So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, the robot has to follow the path on the ground, raise the arm up, spin up a flywheel, align to the goal. All of this stuff has to happen just right. Um, and so we were like, trying to figure out how to do this. Um, this was the first time I really saw practical applications to complex math. Um, so the answer to how you do this is it's a bunch of linear algebra, basically. Um, and I thought it was really cool that there was this beautiful math that had real practical applications. Um, so we talked about a continuously operating dynamical system. Uh, what does that mean? So I gave away two examples in the title, right? Robots and rockets. Um, but you know, cars are examples of this, elevators, but also things that might not seem like continuously operating dynamical systems. Um, like in computer networking, you have queues. And back pressure in these queues is actually a control theory problem. So it's applicable to all sorts of things. Um, so we're going to take the example of an elevator. So I've written up this little live coding system. We have a gray box here, which is our elevator. And then we have the blue line, which is where we want to be. So we can see we have a function to control it. We get passed in the position, the velocity, and the goal. Um, and we can return a force to apply to the elevator. So if we just run this, uh, it's a very scary ride. This is not quite what we want to happen. You can see if we can, we, we can do something like this. Uh, that's a very scary ride in the other way. So uh, we don't quite want that either. And we can see I'm graphing here uh, the position of the elevator and the position of the goal, which we can move around if we want. So if we think, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work here? We can say, uh, if the position is less than the goal, uh, then we'll return positive value. Otherwise, you know, this. Uh, and so this is called, uh, fittingly enough, bang bang control. Right? Uh, we can see this is doing a little bit more what we want, uh, but it's, it's still going to be a very scary ride. This is uh, not ever getting quite where we want it to be. And you know, we can see the oscillations go up and down, uh, but it's not really consistent. They're just sort of all over the place. Um, and the fundamental problem here, the red arrow represents the force that we're applying. And we can see it's switching back and forth very, very quickly. So we can say, well, what we actually want is when we're closer to the goal, we want to apply less force. So we'll make uh, a variable called error. We'll say the error is the difference between the goal and the position. Um, and then we'll say we'll return error times some value. And so if we run this, uh, we can see uh, it doesn't look as good at first. Uh, but there's actually an interesting property here, which is the oscillations are just continually getting smaller and smaller. Um, and so we have a system that's a little bit uh, easier to control, right? Because it's, it's a little bit more predictable. And we can see it'll eventually sort of start to stabilize. Uh, but it's not stabilizing nearly as quickly as we want, right? I'm still not going to be happy if I'm in this elevator. Uh, <laughs> So what can we do to solve this? Uh, well, one thing we can do is we can say uh, we can do something pretty simple. When we're going very fast, we want to slow down. So we'll just apply a little bit of force in proportion to our velocity. Um, so we'll say we'll subtract the velocity uh, times some value. Um, and this value isn't quite enough. Uh, but you can see if we do something like this, we have a very nice smooth curve. And we can play around with it. Our elevator goes exactly where we want it to, um, except it's not quite going exactly where we want it to. There's a problem here, which is we never actually reach our goal. And this makes sense if you think about it, because when we're at our goal, we're going to be applying zero force. And so gravity will pull us down, and we'll slowly hit this equilibrium. Um, so the traditional way to solve this is you add what's called integral control. Um, and you'd make a proportional uh, integral derivative controller. Uh, proportional because we're applying force in proportion to the error. Derivative because we're applying force in proportion to the velocity. Uh, but that's not actually the best solution in this case. Because we know that gravity is accelerating us downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, um, and since I wrote this simulation, I know that the elevator weighs 100 kilograms, uh, we can just apply 980 newtons of force, and this will exactly cancel out gravity. And so now we have this system that goes perfectly where we want it to every time. Um, we can play around a bit with these values, but it looks pretty good. Um, and so this is sort of how you can go from having a system and just 
trying out something that sort of works. Um, and the intuitive way that you build up what's called a PID controller. Um, this is a like, classic solution to all sorts of control theory problems. But I talked a little bit about the mathematical underpinnings here. Um, what are those? Uh, and so the way that I like to look at this is I wrote this simulation. How did I go about that? Um, the answer is like there's some math involved. Uh, we make what's called a state space representation. Uh, so we take all of the variables that represent the state of the system, um, and then we do some math to it out. And so there's this equation that looks sort of complicated, but actually uh, isn't too complicated. So we have x dot equals ax plus bu. Um, and x is the state. Uh, u is the input, and a and b are called state transition matrices. So a represents how the system changes over time if you don't apply any force to it, and b represents if you apply force to it, how does that change the system. Um, so let's figure out what the values of a and b are for our elevator. So our state is the position and velocity, um, and thus the derivative uh, is that is the velocity and the acceleration. And so we want to know uh, what are the values of these question marks. And so if you don't, uh, haven't done matrix math before, I'll explain how it works, which is this value represents what effect position has on velocity. Uh, and this is sort of a trick question, right? Position does not affect velocity, so the answer is 0. Um, next, we want to know how does velocity affect velocity. Uh, this is pretty simple. Velocity is velocity, uh, so that's 1. <laughs> right? How does position affect acceleration? Uh, again, 0. And then finally, uh, this is the interesting one. How does velocity affect acceleration? Um, and the answer is, well, the way friction works, the faster you're moving, the more friction slows you down. Um, so this number is going to represent how much friction there is in the system. Um, so this is negative damping, um, and this is just a way that we represent how much friction there is divided by mass. So this will tell us how our system changes over time um, without apl uh, applying any input. Uh, but there's one problem here, which is we don't have gravity. And the reason for this is we can only represent linear systems with this form. Um, and in engineering, uh, nonlinear basically means really, really hard. So we'll resort to a classic engineering trick of pretending a nonlinear system is linear to make the math easier. Um, and this is why we just ignore gravity. And then the solution in the previous slide of canceling it out works really well, because it means all of our tools to analyze the system still work. Um, then this uh, matrix tells us how uh, applying input to the system changes it. So this is how does force ex uh, affect acceleration. And the answer is uh, force is mass times acceleration. So we put 1 over mass here. Um, and then finally, how does force affect velocity? Again, it doesn't. So we have this equation here. Um, and what we can do is we can just keep track of the, the state variables and then uh, multiply these matrices. And then we do that for each frame of the simulation. And that's how you can simulate this. But you can also do a bunch of other cool things. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can derive an optimal controller. Um, in the previous slide, we were just sort of playing with numbers, figuring out what sort of worked. Um, but you can do that mathematically and figure out the properties of the system. Um, and since this is all linear algebra, right, uh, there's lots of things that, you know, if you've ever taken a linear algebra class, you're talking about like all of these complicated abstract things, right, eigenvalues, whatever, uh, you know, you're sleeping through your class. But it turns out those actually have practical applications. Um, and so, for example, if you take the eigenvalues of these matrices, which, like, I don't even remember what eigenvalues are or how you find them. You know, just plug it into MATLAB, whatever. Um, <laughs> but if you do this, uh, those will tell you whether or not the system is stable, so whether it will converge or diverge, and it'll also tell you how much it will oscillate while it's doing that. So I think it's really cool that there's this complicated math that I didn't know what it was for, but it actually has really direct impacts on the system that you can see with your own eyes. Um, so I think control theory is really cool because it lets you uh, it gives you tools to think about the world and think about the stability of systems um, and how systems change over time. And it uh, uh, shows you all of the mathematical tools that you can use to do that. Um, it's a super deep field. There's all sorts of other things you might be interested in. Right? What happens if you don't have all of the information about your state or if your information about the state is uncertain? Um, and there's ways that you can deal with that. Um, so I think control theory is a lot of fun. Um, if you want to learn more about it, you can play with the simulation in these slides, that first link of my slides. Um, I've written a series of blog posts about it. Uh, and somebody else wrote basically a much better version of this simulation, which is that last link. Thank you.